Well, thank you everyone for joining and for this new episode of the MCAA Around the World webinar series. Today, it's a pleasure to have as a speaker and presenter, Dr. Oral Hamed. So it is as an impressive biography that I will just quickly go through because I'm sure that during his presentation, he will tell us more about his life, his achievement, and how he created a spin-off company working from university. So he obtained his BS degree in electronics from 1987 from METU, and he has also a PhD in physics from Durkheim University in Ankara, obtained in 1994. He then built the first scanning canon microscope in Turkey in 1989, and during his master thesis, and he also built the first UHV SDM in Turkey during his PhD thesis. He then spent five and a half years in Bath and Oxford as a postdoc, and working on scanning hole probe and atomic force microscope before then returning to Bilken in 1999 as a faculty member. He then received multiple awards and prizes. He was an assistant associate and food process for Professor of Bilken between 1998 and 2008 and became then the food professor in 2008-2013 for the Solange University. He then worked as a food professor as well at physics department in Middle East Technical University between 2013 and 2022. And most importantly, I think this major topic of today, today's presentation is that he is the founder of Nanomagnetics Instrument, LTD Oxford UK, which was founded in 1998 and likely as a spin-off company from his study. So thank you very much for accepting to be a part and a host of our webinar and the floor or screen is yours and we will be happy to hear from you and then to open the discussion about the ups and downs of running a spine of company for more than 24 years. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ruben. Can you, can you hear me all right? Yes, perfectly, thank you. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank Murat and Ruben and Marie Curie Alumni Association uh, to give me an opportunity to, to describe what we have been up to. Uh, I I found this this title uh, some time ago, and sometimes uh, I give the talk on this. Uh, so you see a, a nice uh, roller coaster, and then it's 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 actually been a roller coaster ride uh, to to run a small spin-off company uh, for the last twenty four years. Um, let me start the presentation. Um, you may all know about the scanning tunneling microscope and the atomic force microscope. Uh, the STM got the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 1986. Uh, Binich and Rohrer uh, got shared the half of the prize, Nobel Prize with Ruska, who invented the electron microscope uh, in the 30s. The good thing with the STM was that uh, for the first time, in, in time, I mean, for the first time, scientists could see atoms on the surfaces. Uh, and, and I built the first SDM working in air in Turkey uh, for, during my master's thesis. Uh, the, the Bilkent University started about a few years back at that time when I started. So uh, there were only three professors in physics department and five uh, PhD masters and PhD students at that time. So it was quite interesting time. Um, I worked quite hard. Uh, I spent many sleepless nights uh, to make that first microscope operate. Um, in those days, everybody was imaging graphite because it was the uh, only thing people could image. Uh, then people start to image gold and other surfaces. Uh, and then, well, that's obviously in air. In UHV, uh, you could obviously image uh, semiconductors and other uh, reactive materials. So in those days, we didn't have much money, so we could only build uh, an STM that works in, in air. Uh, after that, I, uh, I built a UHV STM. Uh, during my PhD thesis, uh, which, with which we could image these surface atoms and silicon surfaces. Uh, the AFM was invented in 1986 uh, by, uh, by Bini and uh, Christoph Gerber while they were on sabbatical at Stanford. And in the, in the AFM, uh, we measure 
we measure interatomic forces to obtain um, surface topography of non-conducting non and insulating samples. Uh, you can see the surface of silicon 111 crystal in this graph, which was obtained uh, by one of our ultra vacuum STMs in, in, in the university lab uh, some years back. So these show the first uh, room temperature STM at the top uh, and the ultra vacuum STM at the bottom. Uh, and, and in the old days, we could only see graphite surfaces. Later, people started to look at graphene, uh, which is only one layer of uh, graphite. So the uh, the construction of these microscopes took quite a bit of time. Uh, there was not much in infrastructure, so I designed the mechanical parts. I even machined some, some, some of the mechanical components for the ultra vacuum system. I built the electronics from scratch. I built, I wrote the software. So it was, it was pretty hard work, but uh, eventually uh, everything worked. Uh, then I went to Bath University to, to, to do a three years postdoc with Simon Bandin. Um, uh, there we developed the scanning hole probe microscope for low temperature operation. Um, and then after three years, I moved to Oxford University uh, to build an ultra vacuum AFM to obtain atomic resolution with, uh, with very low oscillation amplitudes. Um, there we built, we built uh, an ultra vacuum AFM, uh, which can image surface atoms while we vibrate the cantilever uh, by a very small amount. Uh, during that time, uh, a Japanese professor and the company uh, approached me to build a prototype uh, of the of a, I mean, a prototype and the working scanning hole probe microscope operating at room temperature. So that's how I started up the company. Uh, it was started in that little little room that I can show you here. It was my study room at the time of my home. Um, and then during the during the daytime, I was working at the university full time. Uh, when I was finishing in the in the evening, I was coming back home. And after dinner, I used to work until usually three, four in the morning. Sometimes I, I didn't sleep at all. Uh, then I finished the first product and moved back to Turkey to take a faculty position in Bilkent University. And we established the Turkish branch, Nanomagnetics Turkey, uh, in the, in the uh, 1999 December. Uh, we also have a branch in the USA now, uh, which which mainly does servicing as well as sales. Uh, in total, we have 60 plus people uh, in, Tur in nanomagnetics, uh, UK, USA, and Turkey. Uh, we have four PhDs, a number of PhD and master's students, and about one third of our uh, employees are female. So this is not all of them, some of them are in one of the occasions. Uh, what we do, we build, we started to build whole probe microscopes, but we diverged a bit after that. We have lots of customers everywhere in the world. Uh, NASA, Oxford University, MIT, Harvard, they are all uh, among our customers. Apple is also one of our customers. NASA also uses one of our easy AFMs. Microsoft also uses that. Uh, during the pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have also supplied the AFM to New York University. So how did we start? We started uh, by building uh, scanning whole probe microscopes that we have developed in Bath University with Simon Bending, um, because that was a very unique and uh, very interesting tool to image surface magnetism quantitatively and non-invasively. Uh, the magnetic imaging is not new. Uh, people and scientists have developed lots of different methods with varying 
resolution. The oldest method is possibly the bitter decoration, where you sprinkle uh, iron filings on, uh, on magnetic materials to see the magnetic field gradients. Uh, you can do that at macroscopic scale. You can also do it at uh, even at nano, nanometer scale. Uh, that's very powerful and very simple, very cheap. Uh, there is also much more expensive techniques like Lorentz microscopy, uh, which is a modified transmission electron microscope. There are scanning squid microscopes, which can achieve nowadays uh, about 50 to 100 nanometer resolution. Elizaldo is doing excellent work in Weizmann Institute in Israel. Uh, magneto optic imaging is, is also quite powerful and very fast. Um, and the magnetic force microscopes, which we also start to develop after some resistance. Um, but our, our first microscope, commercial microscope, SHVM, uh, was, was fitting the gap between the Lorentz microscopy and scanning squid microscopy. So how does this work? It's very simple. We make a semiconducting hole sensor. We bring it very close to surface. Uh, we use AFM and STM tracking methods to keep the sensor close to surface. And as we scan it with STM or AFM feedback, we obtain local magnetic flux distribution. Uh, not only you can get images, you can also do local hysteresis measurements. It can operate under high fields as, as the whole probes are suitable for that. We have pretty low noise. Uh, we can even scan very fast, not as fast as electron microscopes or magnetoptic imaging, but we can get about one frame in a second. And we, can, we have operated these uh, down to millikelvin temperatures and up to 300 Kelvin. Um, we couldn't, I mean, in principle, you may even go to higher temperatures by using hole sensors made out of uh, gallium nitride, for example. And we can get down to 50 nanometer resolution. Um, this shows our, um, our best selling scanning uh, probe microscope, which operates as scanning hole probe microscope, AFM, and, and STM. It, it is very small. It usually is inserted in a, in a cryostat with superconducting magnet. Because of that, it is attached at the end of a long stainless steel tube to put it into the cryostat. And the diameter is typically uh, 25 millimeters. Uh, because the cryostat boards are pretty small. And this shows the control electronics, uh, which controls the microscope with the software uh, that we supply. Uh, this also has XY course positioning. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a pretty nice XYZ piezo motor attached to that, which can even lift 100 gram of, uh, of samples. These are the whole sensors that we have developed over the years. The smallest ones were the bismuth hole sensors down to 50 nanometers. Um, and we were stuck at that. And then we were thinking of using uh, carbon nanotubes by natural Y junctions or cross junctions. Then the graphene came along. And then we dreamt of building graphene hole sensors for whole probe microscope imaging. We have actually achieved some of uh, some some progress, uh, but the resolution wasn't very good. Uh, but later, Simon Bending's group have done excellent work on imaging uh, with the graphene hole sensors. So, with the SHVM scanning hole probe microscope, we simultaneously obtain STM or AFM topography with the magnetic image, and at every pixel we get magnetic field distribution. Uh, that obviously depends how close you get to the sample. There is always some smearing out effect due to finite size of the whole sensor, but that's inevitable. That's, that's there in all the scanning probe microscope methods. You can also park your sensor, whole sensor, anywhere on the, on, anywhere on the sample and do local hysteresis measurements. This is a very small magnetometer whole magnetometer you can build. Uh, obviously, the sensitivity isn't as great as squids, but with the squids, the sensitivity 
the case with the area of the uh, area of the squid loop, if the whole sensor is the sensitivity decays with this with the width of the whole sensor. So for smaller whole sensors, the, squid, uh, the whole sensor is actually win uh, because uh, the resolution is 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 not decaying or the sensitivity is not decaying as as fast as uh, as the squid. This shows penetration of individual abricosal vortices into visco single crystal. Uh, these are imaged. This is imaged with one of our uh, low temperature scanning hole probe microscope in real time mode. Uh, the samples were supplied by uh, Professor Kadawaki, and the whole sensor material was supplied by Haldas Strickman from Israel. This was part of uh, my PhD thesis. Uh, my PhD student, Munir Dede, uh, uh, some years back. Uh, initially, we resisted to develop an MFM or AFM, uh, but customers requested uh, to, to have a low temperature AFM as well. Whole probe microscopy was useful, but it was not as popular as AFM or MFM. So due to competition, and to survive, we had to develop a, a low temperature magnetic force and atomic force microscope. So we started with, with our original low temperature SHPM design, and we, we used a fiber optic interferometer uh, to, to measure the deflection of the cantilever. Uh, it took about 12 months to develop this. Um, we actually implemented the fiber optic interferometer that we have developed uh, in our group at Oxford University, and we further improved it at Bilkent. Um, initially, our noise level was about 25 femtometers. Um, so what we do, we use, we cleave a fiber, and then uh, we measure the reflection. We measure the interference between the fiber and as well as the cantilever. Um, this shows a noise level of, of our fiber interferometer. This is the thermal noise of the cantilever because of the uh, thermal, because of the temperature uh, at 77 Kelvin, uh, the, the cantilever is actually resonating uh, at, at its resonant frequency due to this thermal energy. Um, this has pretty good sensitivity and noise level. Uh, compared to our competitors, uh, which is about 300 times better in terms of noise density. We get very, very good, uh, very high resolution in our topography images. We can operate this as conductive AFM or piezo response force microscope. So we can do a lot of, I mean, all kinds of different imaging. But obviously, most people are interested in MFM imaging. And with our microscopes, we can get uh, down to about 10 nanometer magnetic resolution with, with this setup. Uh, this fits into almost any cryostats. We supplied these and PPMS or Oxford instruments or cryomagnetics uh, or cryogenic limited cryostats. Um, in the early days, we, we were usually using liquid liquid helium cryostats, but uh, the, the price of liquid helium skyrocketed. Uh, so the, the closed cycle cryostats have become more popular. Uh, but these closed cycle cryostats usually vibrate like hell because the cryocoolers, either GM or pulse tube heads, uh, they vibrate like crazy. So the whole cryostat is shaking uh, around one and a half hertz and the typical Oscillation amplitudes are about are about one micron or so, or a few microns at least at the cold end. So if you try to get an image, atomic force microscope image in those cryostats is pretty uh, hopeless. Uh, so we thought we could improve that, and we designed an ultra low vibration cryost ultra low vibration cryo free cryostat where we actually decouple the microscope from the cryostat in terms of vibration, um, while we still use the lowest temperature uh, achieved in the cryostat. So that, that's a pretty intricate design. And we can see atomic steps in mica. Mica has one nanometer steps. 
atomic steps. Graph graphi uh, graphite HRPG obviously has much smaller steps, 0.34 nanometers. So we can clearly see atomic steps and, and graphite or HRPG. Uh, so our noise level is about half less than half an angstrom uh, in the in the in this setup. So you can you can see amazing steps, nice steps uh, using these microscopes. You can do PRFM. Uh, on these microscopes, you can also do conduct. Uh, sorry, the Kelvin probe force microscope with with our low temperature FMs, and some people also use our controllers, uh, microscope controllers, as a standalone STM or FM controller. Uh, this shows this shows niobium diselenide sample. You can see these. Uh, you can see the atoms and the niobium diselenide surface. Uh, this image was actually obtained with one of our low temperature AFMs uh, on sixth floor. Uh, our earlier facility was on the sixth floor uh, on a busy road. So even on the sixth floor on a busy road, we can achieve atomic resolution. So imaging abricots of vortices, the single flux quantum in superconductors is quite challenging. Uh, we can do that with SHPM as well as MFM. The, these are MFM images of uh, our because of vortex crystal, single uh, vortex crystal, and uh, in visco single crystal. This is obtained at 100 hertz, sorry, 100 hertz and, and 5 Kelvin. Um, the, the noise level is pretty good, but we want to improve it further. And to do that, we, we employ the Fabry Perot interferometer. With the Fabry Perot interferometers, what you do is you have two mirrors which are parallel to each other. And depending on the reflectivity of the mirror, you may get a lot of multiple reflections. So that's what we do. That's what we did to improve the sensitivity. This was actually the trick we have done, we have developed at Oxford University during my second postdoc. But we have improved it further even at here at uh, our company. So what we do is we caught the end of the fiber with a dielectric mirror, which improves the reflectivity. So the ordinary Michelson interference becomes a fabry perot multiple interference. Uh, the reflectivity increases. And uh, as the photons bounce back and forward multiple times, that increases the slope of this, of this curve. So obviously we had to change the microscope a bit because to make the fabry perot interference to work here, the, fiber, the light from the fiber stick, I mean, it diverges out. So we need to bring these two mirrors very close to each other. So we had to modify the microscope a bit to make the fiber movable by a piezo motor. So when we do that, we get amazing sensitivity. The, the noise level dropped to about one femtometer per root hertz. Uh, this is also a published data. Uh, we, 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 we have shown that this microscope works very well at, very, at various, uh, various uh, conditions. We have done it tapping mode imaging and MFM imaging, as well as abricots of vortex imaging. Our main motivation to develop this microscope was actually to, uh, to design, I mean, to design an MFM, which could get about five or less, I mean, five nanometer resolution. Uh, the, in terms of sensitivity, we have the sensitivity, but uh, the development, I mean, the, for MFM, we need smaller and smaller magnetic tips. So uh, we couldn't get enough uh, sharp cantilevers, and sharp MFM cantilevers to continue further. But we believe that uh, if we engineer the end of the MFM tip, and sharper, you should be able to see MFM resolution about five to ten, about five to four nanometers. Um, the two D materials have become very popular after the invention of graph graphene. Now, the graphene is pretty inert at room temperature, uh, but there is a whole bunch of other materials which are pretty reactive at at, at ambient conditions. So. 
usually they are prepared in glow boxes. So there is a request from Caltech to, to develop an AFM and SDM, which can be which can be uh, loaded in a glove box and taken out and loaded into a cryostat. So that's what we have developed for them. So you can, so this is a sealed environment. So you open the seal and then load the microscope. You load the microscope in the glove box, load the sample in the glove box, seal the system in inert atmosphere, take it out and then put it into uh, the load lock of a cryostat and then evacuate it and then cool it down uh, without exposing the single layer to the materials to the to the sample to the environment so this shows the other diagram uh, we have also operated our microscopes in, in very low temperatures in dill fridges the system was developed for epfl lozano uh, with this, we could go down to about 20 millikelvin temperature. This was in a, a Heliox, uh, Heliox dilution fridge from Oxford Instruments. Uh, we recently have done similar things with a, with a dry cryostat. This one was a wet cryostat. We have done the same thing in a dry cryostat. You can see this in a, in a, vector vector magnet dilution fridge so this system goes down to 20 milli k and to operate the afms in milli kelvin temperatures you obviously i mean the, the cooling power of these dill fridges are amazingly small uh, they caught one milliwatt but if you apply one milliwatt power uh, the temperature rises up to 120 milli k so to do that we had to reduce the power of our fiber interferometer uh, so what we have done is we have actually reduced it down to 200 nanowatts and we could still operate our microscopes without affecting the base temperature of the, of the build fridge. This works also as a confocal and MV center microscope. Um, so we have been developing these for a while. And this is another system, another confocal microscope system that we have developed for Izmir Institute of Technology. In this one, we actually couple the cryostat into this. This cryostat is a nine Tesla superconducting magnet. Uh, so not to be affected by this magnet, uh, we, we bought a stainless steel, non-magnetic stainless steel optical table. And the cryostat is attached to the table by using edge welded bellows to reduce the vibrations. Uh, we have recently developed a low temperature apochromatic objective uh, with very high numerical aperture and uh, very long working distance. Uh, this is pretty high working distance for this kind of high numerical apertures. And this also works down to millikelvin temperatures and at high magnetic fields. There are no glues in in the in the system everything is spring loaded so that uh, nothing cracks down when we cool it down so this 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 objective works pretty well the this shows the uh, confocal microscope image in the raman mode you can do photoluminescence or raman uh, imaging uh, so this is molybdenum disulfide raman map obtained by by our user customer in izmir and this is a single layer graphene map uh, obtained with this cold objective. This shows the optical schematics of, of our confocal uh, system, which can be also operated as Raman or MV center microscope. This is the optical setup. This is the uh, this is the microscope tested in air at ambient conditions before being inserted into. Cryostat. So we couple our microscopes directly into cryostat, sometimes on optical tables, or we, we design these ultra low vibration stages uh, to, to have very low noise levels. This shows our nano positioners, which can lift up about 100 grams uh, at low temperatures. 
and this is the uh, our this is our low temperature. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you are with this. And this shows the confocal microscope imaging uh, at the at the user side. So we are we are building this MV center microscope with which we we couple an MV center in diamond tip uh, with the specimen uh, to measure the uh, local magnetic flux density on the surface. Uh, this is achieved by modifying our confocal microscope. You can see the MV center uh, needle there, which is operated by a coarse crystal tuning fork. Uh, this shows the coarse crystal tuning fork and the specimen, this is optical microscope image. And the QTF image from MV center is, is shown there. This is the AFM feedback image. So we are very close to get the uh, ME center images soon. This shows the um, millikelvin version of the MV center microscope. We have also been developing ambient AFMs, uh, but the competition is tough with the uh, with the other companies. This is our high performance AFM, uh, which has about 10 femtometer noise level. Uh, it has pretty good optical microscope. It does a lot of things. This is single layer graphene image. You can see. Uh, you can run it in uh, all the different modes, either in life sciences or uh, material science. You can image conductive materials in and Kelvin probe and other modes. This is KPFM image again. You can run it as capacitance microscope, MFM, PSO, PRFM. This is an image of single wall carbon nanotubes uh, obtained by our customer in Imperial College, London. You can see uh, the the network of these single single wall carbon nanotubes. Uh, competition was tough in crowded AFM market, so we we thought we could perhaps design a very simple uh, AFM which can be operated not by PhDs or masters degree scientists, uh, but simply technicians. It had to be very cheap and very simple, and the price tag should be about 20k euros or dollars. So we, we got some government funding to develop this, and then we, we made it work. And then it, it, uh, a lot of customers use it, like Microsoft, Samsung Display. Samsung Display and Apple, I think, uses, use them for, uh, for developing their uh, smart pixels in the, sm in the smartphones. These smartphones, pixels, they even have nanostructures in them. Uh, I don't know what they do, but uh, they clearly are imaging those at nanometer scale. This mi little microscope uses uh, a lot of uh, intriguing methods. Uh, we, we, we even have a very good optical microscope. It uses an alignment-free cantilever technology, so when you put a new cantilever, all the optical alignment is done automatically. Uh, and we have an integrated video microscope. You can see the objective of a video microscope there. This also has a voice coil motor, so we can move it up and down to adjust the focus. We can get pretty good images. Uh, this is MFM data. This is uh, graphene hexagonal boron nitride heterostructure. We can even image single layer graphene with this little cheap microscope. This is single layer graphene image. This is bilayer graphene image obtained uh, with this microscope. You can put it in glow box. It's pretty simple, small. You can even image some uh, uh, plasmid DNA, which has one nanometer uh, diameter. This is plasmid DNA image. Uh, we have also, during the pandemic, obviously, uh, the operation of the company were, were disrupted, uh, but uh, one of our former employees, Dr. Unit Celik, who is now a professor at Pratt University, obtained uh, the first ever AFM images of SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, and this was published at RS RSC Advances uh, two years back. Um, this shows the video of 
the of the EZFM optical microscope. The, the periodic structure there is 1.7 micro. So the optical microscope resolution is better than two microns. You can even if you can you can see that we can adjust the focus electronically. So this little microscope has a much better optical resolution, optical microscope than the very expensive competitors microscope. Uh, we have, as you know, the AFM community is moving towards faster and faster speeds. Uh, so Umit, Umit Chelik was one of our employees who did his PhD at the company. Uh, he chose not to work with us anymore. Uh, he wanted to go to university after this. Uh, and during his thesis, we developed a very fast AFM, uh, which can scan amazingly large areas. So we could achieve 100, sorry, 1,000 lines per sca second scanning speed at 15 by 15 micron range. So we developed a very fast scanner. Let me show the let me show the fastest speed. This is eight frames per second. This is a calibration grating. We were moving the calibration grating with our hands, so the images look like the SCM images. Let me see. Then we want to get some samples from. I mean, we want to image something fast, which is happening in real time. At that time, a professor, a Yakinji, uh, brought an iron sulfide sample, which was getting oxidized in air. So we were getting some images of that. Then we realized that we, could, we can actually try to test it with, with this sample. So you can see these atomic steps on the, on the microscope. What we have done to, to, to make the oxidation faster, we have breathed it on the sample. So let, let me start the imaging. This is four frames per second. As we imaged, we breathe it on the sample, and then you can see the, uh, the, uh, the sample being oxidized with the humidity, with the, uh, with the water vapor in the, in the breath. So the image rate is four frames a second at 13 by 13 micro speed. The feedback loop of this, this system operates at uh, at 90 megahertz. Um, but we haven't commercialized this microscope yet, so we, we, we still have problems and uh, we don't have any timeline when they are going to commercialize this. All the other fast AFMs, they, they only scan about uh, 200 nanometers or thereabouts at, at close to these rates. Uh, over the years, we have also been developing the whole effect measurement systems. Uh, a potential customer insisted us to develop this for some reason. Uh, so we have done this. Um, then later on, uh, we developed low temperature versions of that. Uh, and we can also build rotators to rotate the specimen in cryostats. And this particular one is, is a is a rotator which rotates the specimen in this direction, in theta direction, as well as pi direction. So it rotates the specimen in, in two different axes. And the rotation is, is more than one circle. You can move it 370 degrees in two directions. Uh, we have also developed an easy to use full effect measurement system for people who doesn't want very, who doesn't want to get a very expensive system and want to get results very, very fast. We, we are also selling a lot of these. Uh, we have been developing vibrating sample magnetometers for some time. Uh, we started this about six years ago uh, at room temperature. Then we moved it into low temperatures. Uh, this is a system we supplied to Pakistan recently. There is another system we supplied to India. But it's not being installed yet. We shall install it. And there is a customer in Algeria who wanted to get 
a huge electromagnet and one ten, one one thousand Kelvin operation. We have we have stuff like this as well. Uh, it, about six years back, we we have obtained Islamic Development Bank Science and Technology Prize, which included a one thousand one hundred thousand dollars prize money. Uh, we have put that prize money back into company. We have bought some. CNC machines to, to make our production uh, faster. So we have a lot of customers across the world. We, we, we supplied to all the continents apart from Antarctica, uh, but we still have to have to keep pedaling. Uh, so building scientific instruments uh, is interesting, but every every customer is is requesting usually something different and then if you stop pedaling you may go with the momentum for a while but afterwards uh, you slow down quite fast so we have to keep pedaling uh, all the time to improve ourselves so i would like to thank you for your attention uh, it's been almost 50 minutes or 45 minutes thank you very much and thank we are we are still hiring, so if, if you know anyone who is looking for jobs, uh, we would be happy to talk to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And now we're definitely going to open the discussion, and I'm going to let Murat ask you a couple of questions, and I will keep an eye on the chat if everyone wants to ask something. Feel free to drop a message or to raise your hands. I will give you the word, of course, and thank you again, and yeah. Let's open the floor and you can ask whatever you want to, Dr. Hora. Thank you, Ruben, for the introduction. And thank you, Professor Ali, for this you know, amazing uh, works you have done during your uh, research. So my first question is related to your achievements regarding your also position in academia. Uh, I know that you were continuously in academia and together with the uh, companies like what would be the most difficult thing that you have faced with because and you have done a lot of work and it's time consuming and on the other side you have like duties in academia you were in the uh, dean of science and art faculty uh, as far as i remember so also like a lot of duties on the other side in academia so what would be the like most difficult thing that you have faced with and what would be the recommendation for us for this? Um, yes, for a long time I carried both duties and uh, I, I got early retirement in March. Uh, so I've been at the company full time for the, for the last six months. Uh, and for four years of, or about four years, I was also dean at the Faculty of Science and Arts at METU. Uh, at that time, I didn't spend much time at the company. I was just coming for at most half a day a week. Um, so, I mean, it was uh, it was quite difficult to to juggle both things at the same time because uh, uh, because keeping the cutting edge, I mean, keeping uh, a good research program at the at the university. Uh, and is difficult. It was it was challenging. I had to keep getting grants from the funding agencies, Europe as well as uh, the Turkish local uh, science council, uh, encouraging students, postdocs, etc. Uh, and at the same time, uh, running this running a high tech spin off company is difficult because. Um, you don't have to be, I mean, you have to be good, otherwise you cannot survive in the business. Uh, you have to be as good as, as, at least as good as your competitors, otherwise nobody would like to buy your equipment. Uh, making cheaper equipments doesn't make sense because everybody is, is, is racing with each other to get, grow, uh, at, get research funding. So you have to be good, better than the competitors in some respect so that the users uh, or your customers would, would, would prefer you. Um, so it was hard work, but nevertheless, 
we have, I suppose we have managed to a degree. Uh, I haven't done everything that I dreamt for, but I suppose that's, that's life. Uh, I mean, looking back, it was, it was tough. It is still tough. I mean, the complexity of anything grows with the number of people, either with number of particles or number of people. And usually the complexity and the problems you face with uh, increases not linearly with the number of people. It usually goes with uh, quadratically or even exponentially. Um, I mean, one of the difficulties is in the early days, dealing with, with a smaller size company was simpler because you are dealing with smaller number of problems. Um, and I mean, the financing can be a big problem. Uh, and I mean, funding for high tech companies is, does exist in, in, in Turkey and the UK. Uh, but it can be challenging, so you cannot rely on them. So you have to you have to rely on the customers. You have to rely on their sales. And uh, our first product uh, was sold before it was it was it was built. So uh, for those young people who who aspire to start up companies, I would strongly recommend to establish the company after finding a customer and getting, hopefully getting a purchase order to start with. And you can, you should perhaps try to persuade your customers uh, to come up with, with some down payment. Uh, you may also go with venture capital, capitals, but that's another path. Uh, that's also feasible. But then I was uh, starting up, that was not an option. Um, so, well, that's how it started. Um, during the discussions, uh, the deal, our first deal with the Japanese company may, may, may have been falling down. And then uh, my, uh, my supervisor at Oxford University, who, who was also uh, a successfully uh, starting up companies in the US, uh, he was also suggesting to uh, act as a venture capitalist capitals at that time, if that deal uh, was to fail. But fortunately, the, uh, the, um, the deal didn't fail. Uh, and then I started up the company with the down payment of the first order that I received uh, from the customer. So that was a unique product. But if you develop something unique, uh, the, the edge may not last for long. So later on, other people also try to develop something similar uh, to yours. Thank you very much. Yes, it is very um, interesting because you have started your company first finding the client and you build the first instrument in your home, getting the, like some down payment. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, those companies have not yet known that you have developed an instrument. I think there is a trust based on the PhD you had and the instrument you have developed during your PhD because I, I see that like more or less seven years after you have developed the first SDSM after the Nobel Prize. So this is actually like a quite a short time and you were alone. So for this, I was going to ask the question but the Tony is one of the, our participants uh, asking a question saying, when and how did the idea of funding a company came to you? So there wasn't my question <laughs> that Tony is asking. Uh, well, when I was actually about to finish my PhD, I was, I was trying to spin off uh, a cheap STM uh, into the market. Uh, I even tried to make a company uh, at that time, but I couldn't find a customer. So I had to shove the idea. So um, then after, after Bath University, after the postdoc at the Bath University, when I was doing postdoc at uh, Oxford, uh, and all of a sudden this, uh, this professor and the company from Japan approached, uh, approached me. So they were, uh, they were trying to sell new products in Japan. And they, they saw the results 
of our publications from Bath University. So they thought that this could be a good idea to sell. So they found me. So I was lucky at, at that point. Uh, so Jap Japanese people usually take, or companies usually take long time to decide. So the discussions took about nine months or so. Uh, so I was, I was lucky enough to get that attention. Uh, so, so I don't know, it, it started like that. But if I hadn't done everything myself, I couldn't have started up a company. Perhaps I could have done it, but uh, it could have been more difficult. Uh, and I mean, as, as, as founders, you have, I mean, if, if you are aspiring to be founder, you have to make sure that you can manage everything. I mean, you can, of course, outsource some of the stuff, but the key technology uh, must be with you. And then you have to control all of it. Uh, and other things may go wrong. You may outsource things which may not be as good as you want. Uh, so you also have to have uh, different plans. And if something goes wrong, you should be prepared to do that part as well. It's just like running a pizza shop or uh, or a restaurant. If 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 the if the chef gets angry with you and departs, you have to be prepared to go go to the kitchen and do everything yourself. So thank you very much. Yeah, this is an interesting journey. Uh, the second question I would ask is, um, we know that early, early career researchers like the PhD students have two options, to continue in academia or switching to the business, but you did both. So the question is that if a researcher is thinking move the industry, setting up their own spin-off, like what, what kind of skills or trainings they would have? And it would be great if they have in advance and maybe during their PhDs, they could get these trainings and that they would be prepared also for business. What, what would be based on your experience? Um, uh, well, I mean, they have to be they have to be prepared to do everything themselves, as I've said earlier. It, they should, they should, I mean, uh, all the things that they may think that may go wrong uh, usually get, goes wrong at some point. I mean, the funding may disappear, uh, the, the person you are trusting uh, may fail or may, 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 may stop working for you. Uh, so it's, it can be quite tough. And uh, so in the early days, you may you may be prepared to uh, fight like an SAS soldier. So, uh, so it can be quite tough. Um, but I would recommend, I mean, to be successful, I would recommend definitely to find an edge. So uh, making something uh, slightly cheaper or slightly better usually doesn't work. Uh, so you, I mean, your success. Uh, potential would increase if, if you if you try to put something innovative and new in the market so that would differentiate you among the others and then that would be uh, relatively easy to sell um, the academia and the university i mean i didn't have much choice so i was uh, i was i mean i i always wanted to be an academic so this uh, this company was a was like a toy initially, but then it it it, it grew uh, day by day. So we now have sixty people, sixty more, sixty plus people. Uh, but in the early days, uh, the funding in Turkey was extremely limited. So uh, I had to build all the equipment myself. So that was I mean that was partially used that by the company. Mm -hmm. It was it was working for both both. Uh, both the company as well as the university research group mm -hmm. and since i built everything myself so i got the habit of building almost everything software electronics uh, the mechanical parts we obviously bought uh, quite a lot of other things but mm -hmm. the, the core of the stuff we have been building all along 
Uh, and one drawback is once you start to, I mean, once you get into this habit, it's difficult to buy other equipment. Uh, you want to control uh, everything. I mean, during my career, I, I mean, initially, I was telling that uh, there are two kinds of people who build instruments. It's either you don't have money to build the uh, to buy the instrument, uh, or the instrument doesn't exist. So, uh, for some time, I thought that there are two types of academicians or researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, then I also realized there are people who have lots of money, like people in Stanford or Harvard. They have a lot of money. They can buy anything they want, but they still want to build their own instruments. Uh, right. They force their students. They pay more money to build instruments, write software. Uh, so there are actually three kinds of people in academia uh, or industry. <laughs> well, not in the industry. Industry is different. So. There are also those people in academia, uh, rare, but there are a number of people, quite a few people, who have a lot of money, but they prefer, they still buy commercial equipment, but they still force their students and postdocs to build equipment because they want to control everything. Uh, they don't trust the companies mm -hmm. to uh, uh, supply them the equipment, or they, they think that they can improve it further. Yeah. If you're really trying to do something different, you, you usually have to do, it, do something different. Either buy an equipment or modify it or do something completely different from the existing ones. Yeah, so you, the main idea that we can get from your answer is that, you know, everything is related to you and your motivation and your contribution to the company and the product you are going to produce for clients. So you need to know exactly what you're cooking in your kitchen and what you're selling to the client. So like, it, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a lot of work, I would say. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, questions. So, yeah, please, audience, if you have any questions, do not hesitate. Uh, Maria has a question. Says, what does Professor Oral think of accelerator incubator programs? Uh, there are so many out there and how to choose. Um, I mean, it's, it's difficult. I never thought of that. When I was doing that, we were also in an incubator. Uh, I mean, I suggest you to choose the cheapest ones and the ones which would offer you the, the best, uh, best, best conditions. Uh, yes, I mean, we were in an incubator, but in those days, there was there were very small of them. I mean, there there were a very small number of them, so the choice was not much. Uh, nowadays, it became fashionable uh, to, to start up businesses. And there are lots of people uh, who try to encourage young people. Uh, it, it also came into, I mean, it also become, became too fashionable. Everybody, everybody wants to do that. Uh, I would warn you, I, I should warn you that, I mean, if you really have a, a viable idea, uh, then you should do it. Uh, so. You, it, it, it is very hard work. You have to work like crazy. Uh, I mean, in, in those early days, I was working like 18 hours a day or 16 hours a day. Uh, I'm still working hard. Now I'm working about 12 hours a day. Um, so I like it. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite nice experience. I mean, it's, it's very exciting. It's, it's very exciting, but it, it is very hard work. Um, so the incubator programs, yeah, I mean, I would I would choose the best ones, which would give you the best uh, best uh, conditions uh, at the cheapest price. Uh, I mean, some of them can be can be expensive. Uh, so difficult. Yeah, I totally agree with you. When I had my own spin-off in Turkey back in Ankara, 2015, I chose the actually the the, be, the best um, incubator, the one who gives the, the exactly like the cheapest prices to to continue for you to spend more money for your research or for your product, 
instead of like recommendation for other services. And also related to the, uh, the services that you can get from, for example, if you're going to agree with a company, uh, signing a DNDA in the beginning is very important. If you have no experience, I think this would be a challenge. So uh, another question from Irene. You say, so you have mentioned that at the moment you just have to keep pedaling. How did you ensure sustainability of the company after those initial stages and how do you keep doing that now? Yeah, like you, you mentioned that, you know, you have upsides and ups and downs. So didn't you have a moment to give up saying that, hey, okay, that's it. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> you know, you had, but how you overcame for this at the end? I mean, yeah, I mean- It's a great had, question, I would say. Yeah. We had lots of down, uh, downs and ups. Um, uh, I don't know, sometimes, Perhaps I, I, I should be quite masochistic to, to keep doing this, but no, it's, it's, I suppose it, it might be the adrenaline. So it's quite exciting to do challenging things. Uh, I, I'm not doing it for money. I mean, I, we have some money accumulated over the years, uh, but it's, it's not a good, I mean, it's, it's not a good path to, to become rich. So if you want to be rich, uh, it's not a good way to, to make money. Years ago, when I was at Bath University, I was, uh, after the lunches, I was reading magazines, physics magazines at the common room. And there was an article at Physics World uh, at, the, at one of the back pages, one of the last pages. It, it was usually written by, uh, uh, by an entrepreneur. And there was a guy who was saying that it's not a good idea to become rich, or it's not a path to become rich, uh, to run up, I mean, to run a startup company. I, I read that, it was interesting, but I didn't trust, I mean, I didn't believe it. So uh, years later, I realized that the guy, I, I forget who, who that was, uh, was telling the truth. So, um, so you wouldn't be, I mean, you, you may be lucky to become rich, but uh, you shouldn't do it to, to become rich or to aim uh, wealth out of scientific equipment manufacturing. Um, how did I ensure the sustainability of the company? I mean, it's, it's very tough. Uh, you cannot ensure anything. So I think even the large companies are struggling so it's uh, running a company is difficult whether it's high tech or non high tech so it's making money is difficult i mean all my family uh, was paid workers i was paid worker for a long time so as a paid worker you don't appreciate uh, the difficulty of uh, running a business so it's, it's it can be quite tough uh, you have to pay the people at the end of the month and you cannot stop paying them even, even if you don't have money. So you have to, you have to go and borrow money at, at some time, you have to borrow money at really high interest rates. So it can be quite challenging and you have to prepare, you have to be prepared to uh, take risks and the risks can be quite large. And the financial risks may also be quite large. Uh, so we still, I mean, we, we are not ensuring the sustainability, so it's, it's quite challenging, but it is, uh, I mean, we still, we are still around over the last, or, I mean, after 25 years, after 24 years, and we, we think that we, we, will, we will flourish further. Uh, there will be more challenges, uh, I mean, the, the COVID, COVID-19 was a big blow. So for the first time, we thought that we were going to go down uh, and we had to let some people leave at the early days of the COVID-19. Uh, for the first time, I thought that we will, uh, we will go bankrupt, but uh, we, we survived. And we actually increased our sales during the COVID-19. Uh, but we, you had to be, sometimes you had to be ruthless as well. Uh, to make 
decisions you have to be ruthless uh, to, to survive. Okay, the Tony yeah. question, was there a moment when you want to leave your company because the business became too stressful and then returned to full academia? Yes, I could have done it. I mean, sometimes it was very painful. I, there, there were quite a lot of stressful days and sleepless nights. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, you think that you cannot pay the debts or you cannot find money to keep paying people. So it was tough. I thought a bit, but then I, I chose not to quit. Um, then there came a moment that I, I, I wanted to stop working at the academia. Um, I, I could have stayed in the academia for another 10 years, but uh, I gave up the academia. Question if she is here. Uh, before his question, then I can, I want to ask maybe my last question before the audience. So you were working hard in your company and also like you have the duties in university and how would you manage like work and life balance? Like what would you recommend for us? Like we are in academia, already we are overwhelmed with a lot of work, uh, projects, deadlines, uh it's already too much that we feel or like i feel and many many researchers are thinking to quit the academia after phd they do not want to continue and some people some researchers do not want to continue after even master people so i would be interested in the answer like um i mean it was it was tough but i don't know perhaps i i wanted hard things and I always wanted to be a physicist. Uh, due to social pressures, uh, I had to study electronics, <clears throat> electronics engineering, but uh, then I quit electronics. Uh, I had a, I, I could have just carried on electronics, had a pushy life and planned life and lifetime employment in one of the electronics companies. Uh, but I, I wanted to be a physicist, so I, uh, uh, it was, uh, don't know. I mean, I, I, I quite liked what I've done. Um, the the, the R&D, I mean, the, the scientific equipment that we have been developing at the company is, is, is also very challenging. <clears throat> In the university, I mean, you, uh, you want to do something different. Your students work hard. They make something work for a short period of time. They publish the paper. They move on to something else, or they they just graduate and move on. Uh, if the company is different, I mean, you have to make it work first, and then you have to make sure that you ship it to the other end of the world. I mean, the end of the world, uh, the other side of the world. Uh, let's say twenty thousand kilometers away, and then these guys open the box, press the button, and then make it work. So it should work like that. So it's it's quite challenging to make it operate from from on top of the table uh, as a prototype and make sure that it works every time or most of the times when they press the button uh, so that's that's quite challenging and then it's, it's quite hard work for example the easy as easy afms that we have developed we have shipped five of them to us and only one of them works during the during the transit, we, we were we were not careful. We, we didn't think something. Uh, didn't put securing. I mean, during the transit, there can be lots of acceleration. Uh, I mean, it was hard. It was working well, but during the transit, we had to fix it. So we did, we forgot that, and all of only but one uh, worked. So then we fixed that. So. It's pretty, 
it's pretty good. It's operating pretty well now. But uh, these simple things uh, can be quite quite painful, and very simple mistakes can cause you thousands of dollars uh, at the company. Mm -hmm. Something which would normally cost one dollar, it would cost a few thousand dollars to you to repair and to tarnish your reputation as mm -hmm. well. Above it. Nice. Yeah, uh, Ruben is here. Ruben. Yes. So as we is your share. Yeah, in the last like minutes before the end of this webinar. I wanted to close like the session with this last question, which is like closer to what the Marie Curie Alumni Association is. And so, can you hear me? Because you're frozen to me. Uh, I, I didn't hear the last sentence. Okay, sorry, because I saw that you froze up. So what the question would be, we have seen that your careers have been split between business and academia at the same time. And also more at the beginning specified that most of the time, early stage researcher doing a PhD, then they have to choose like remain in academia or going to business side. So they always have to make a decision. But we are also seeing that, for example, many Marie Curie scholarship now are trying to bridge academia and businesses. So making them collaborate and work together. For example, I was part of an ITN. We have companies working and supporting academia. So trying to do research together. So what's your point? Is it something that is important to keep doing? Is it impor important to having businesses collaborating with academia? And is it important as well for academia to have businesses to count on? Uh, I think it is quite important. I mean, in the early days of the company, uh, I was, uh, we were collaborating with my group in the university, but now we came to a stage where we cannot keep doing that. Uh, we have two professors at, at Middle East Technical University who are our consultants, uh, and their PhD students also help us. So we do joint R&D projects with them. So that also benefits uh, their group. Uh, I mean, we supply them equipment, we supply them funding uh, to fund students, uh, to fund their research. So it's, uh, I think it, it can be quite useful. Uh, it's also useful for students. I mean. When they graduate, they, they would have another opportunity. Uh, if they like, they can join the company. Um, I think it is quite important. We also collaborate with Bath University with Simon Manley. Uh, we also have some other friends which we have uh, loose collaborations. Uh, they supply us things, we supply them things. Uh, so it is, I think it's quite natural especially for scientific equipment manufacturing. So we have to, uh, I mean, it's, you, you may build a very good instrument, but somebody has to use it as well. So it's, uh, there is also that aspect. Um, and obviously, I mean, at this current rate of PhD production or PhD graduation, not everybody can be, can be uh, employed at the universities. So they have to be, uh, they have to be em employed at the, at the companies. And if, if the students during their PhDs or masters, if, if they're also exposed to the requirements of the companies, which may be quite different, than, which are usually quite than the universities, uh, they would also help them to uh, uh, adjust themselves for the future. I mean, at the end of the day, the companies they are different, but the other companies as well, they have to survive, they have to, they have to make something profitable, whether it's research or production or consulting. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, everybody has to make money. Uh, everybody has to make something different than the others uh, to, to survive. Thank you very much, Murat. I can leave the screen to you for the wrap up if you have any final question and to close the meeting. Great. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ora for his time and insight about his life related to the academia and business and his company and adventure throughout this um, uh, spin off company. And myself, and on behalf of Bridging Science and uh, Academia, 
Beijing Business and Science Working Group. So thank you very much for flourishing our uh, stage and hope to see you again. I would like to thank you all uh, to invite me and to listen to me about my uh, personal adventures <laughs> over the last 25, almost 25 years. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all the participants and for your question. And with that, have a nice evening, you all. And I'm going to close the webinar. And thank you again. Bye. Thank you, thank you Ruben, for your time and effort. Have a nice weekend to everyone. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye.